if someone in the uh, upper room would also speak back to us just for fun. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I can indeed, so thank you for that quick sound check. I appreciate it. So uh, with that, we will come to order. Thank you, uh, committee, and everyone who is attending and following along. Um, we will take final action on a few bills towards the end of our meeting today. Uh, one thing I'd like to get crossed off of our list does look at the approval of minutes. The chairman has forgotten to mention that on previous meetings, so you may notice there are a few sets of minutes that we have. I'd ask if anyone has any additions or corrections. Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any additions or corrections, but I would move to approve the minutes of January 25th, 27th, February 1st, 3rd, 8th, 10th, and 15th. Thank you, Representative. Do I have a second? Seconded by Representative Dodson. Uh, I think I will skip debate on that unless there is anything that is pressing. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve minutes say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes and the minutes are approved and thanks to the committee assistant for putting all of those together. That will move us to our first item of business, which is a hearing on House Bill 2399, uh, with, which deals with amortizing the state and school capers unfunded actuarial liability. We'll start with an overview from the reviser. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. House Bill 2399 would amortize the CAPERS unfunded actuarial liability of the state of Kansas and school participating employers that exists under the system over a period of 24 years, uh, commencing December 31, 2018, and requires the uh, CAPERS Board of Trustees to certify employer contribution rates for uh, the state and school group based on the new amortization schedule. And part of the reason why it looks back at December 31st of 2018 is that that's the valuation in which the initial FY 2022 um, contribution rates were established. So, that, so then to effectuate the FY 2022, uh, that it's going to be based on that valuation. Uh, the bill also eliminates level dollar employer contribution payments of 6.4 million and 19.4 million per year. Oh, for uh, they were scheduled to be paid over 20 years that were placed in statute after employer contributions were delayed by the legislature in uh, FY 2017 and FY 2019. Um, new section one of the bill is the actual, the, the kind of the budget mechanism to realize the FY 2022 savings due to reamortization um, by saying that if any legislation that, it, that amortizes the unfunded liability or for Kansas and the uh, state of Kansas and school participating employers is passed by the legislature and enacted into law, then uh, uh, each amount, the amount in each account of the state general fund of each state agency that is appropriate for fiscal year 2022 that is equal to the difference between the amount budgeted for employer contributions under current law and the amount required for employer contributions under the new uh, amortization period. That, that difference, so kind of that, that lesser amount would be lapsed from the fiscal year 2022 budget. And that's what provides some of the savings under the, uh, the governor's uh, budget plan. Uh, the same procedure would take place to reduce expenditure limitations um, for special revenue funds in the state treasury during uh, fiscal year 2022 as well. And the, the bill is effective upon publication in the statute book, July 1st, 2021. And and this, you know, this is a similar bill as was, was in last year's bill. It was a 25 year period at that point, but 2503. So it's, it's, it's very similar to what you might have seen uh, last year in terms of uh, the procedure. And I can stand for any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Committee, any questions for the reviser? And not seeing any, um, and you'll you'll have to. Uh, oh, was there a question? Not not seeing any. You'll have to wave wildly in the other room or make a sound uh, for you to come up on the screen for us, also to make sure that we recognize you if needed. Uh, but thank you for the overview. 
And I believe we'll dispatch formally with the fiscal note since the author of the fiscal note is also one of our proponents. And uh, if it is appropriate and you'd like to either start with the fiscal note or go straight into the proponent testimony, I would let that be at your discretion and we would welcome the director of the budget, Adam Profit. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Adam Profit. I am the director of the budget for the state of Kansas. Um, I do not, and I should, <laughs> given my title, I should have a copy of the fiscal note with me, but I don't have the official copy. Um, I have, of course, read it a few times, as I mentioned, uh, authored and signed it as well, so happy to answer any questions. I'll be sure to touch on some of that during my testimony, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Okay, very good. So um, I, I stand before the committee here uh, respectfully as a proponent of House Bill 2399. Um, as mentioned by the reviser, this would reamortize the current unfunded actuarial liability or UAL as I'll refer to it throughout my testimony uh, for a period of 24 years, which represents a 10 year extension from the current schedule. Um, as also noted, this was part of the governor's budget uh, recommendation. Um, I would call it a key component of the governor's recommended budget. Um, something that, that we think helps provide budget stability uh, and predictability in the years to come for the state budget. So as we move forward, uh, given the reasons why we are a proponent of it and, and put this out there, um, pre-COVID, if we think back to where things were, uh, the economy was doing very well. Uh, we were experiencing really historic lows, levels of unemployment. I think we were at 2.8% unemployment as a state right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and then of course, March happened. Uh, and once March happened all across the country and specifically in Kansas as well, um, things uh, kind of came to a halt and revenues have declined. Um, we've been able to weather the storm that that's brought to date uh, in large part because this body and the governor have put together some budgets that have put us in a good position to be able to, to handle some things uh, like that. And while the, the revenues are showing signs of improvement, uh, we still need to exercise extreme caution as we move forward because things are still a bit uncertain. Uh, revenues have kind of been up and down and you've seen moving targets. Uh, so we need to be very judicious with our expenditures. Um, I think that's evidenced by the fact that in the governor's budget, um, the starting point was a 10% reduced resource package for most of the SGF funded agencies. Um, but we also need to identify areas of savings in the SGF and that's where this bill comes into play as it, it does identify an area of savings for the SGF. Um, it also provides us a good opportunity to make sure that we're making contributions as we move forward throughout the amortization period for the unfunded actuarial liability. And I'll touch on that in just a bit. So um, as it relates to the revenues, extending the payments um, does reduce the amount of SGF that's required to uh, fund the UAL in the coming years. There is a cost for it uh, with it to be sure. Uh, and I'll touch on that a bit, a bit later, but it does free up some SGF immediately. Um, on page two of my testimony, you'll find a chart that compares the current payment schedule and SGF requirements for the contributions versus what they would be under this reamortization. Um, you can see that in fiscal 22, under the current plan, we are projected to contribute uh, over $658 million to the UAL. If we are to reamortize, as is proposed uh, in this bill, that contribution goes down to $499 million, specifically for the state and school groups. That's an SGF savings of $158.7 million in the first year of the reamortization period. And then over the next couple of years, that savings grows to $160 million, $166 million, and then $173.4 million in fiscal 25. So again, we get some immediate relief in SGF that we can free up uh, to spend on some, some precious resources and services for Kansans across the state. But also this provides a more manageable level of employer contribution rates uh, under the current schedule. And what that means is uh, the way we fund this is on a uh, percent of uh, salary basis. So um, right now we are scheduled to be at 15% contribution rates for fiscal year 22 under the current schedule, 15.1, I believe. We're, under amortization, we're able to bring that down by over three percentage points. So in fiscal 22, on that same chart that I referenced earlier, you can see that again, the current baseline is 15.1%, uh, what we're to contribute under the reamortization plan that drops down to 11.92%. So over three percentage point drop. And the reason that is important is because it makes it more likely that as we go forward, we're able to maintain the payments as we're committed to each and every year. Uh, it's important because if you just look back at fiscal year 17 and fiscal year 19, the state actually skipped or reduced the payment into the CAPERS pension plan against the UAL uh, that we were supposed to make. 
So anytime you skip a payment uh, with the UAL, you're completely eroding any benefit that you have with the current amortization schedule that you have. All you're doing is adding debt onto the back end, which I realize we're doing that with amortization anyway, but you're moving that debt to the back end without any of the other tangible benefits that we're speaking about here. So skipping a payment is a, a very dangerous and, and clearly a very tempting uh, proposition for us to do, as we've done it a couple of times just over the last five fiscal years. By keeping the contribution rates uh, lower, it, it just maintains a, a better sense uh, of confidence that we're going to be able to make those payments as we move forward. One other point to consider uh, is that while the CAPERS board has, um, they did a study on this, and I believe Mr. Conroy is in the room and he can speak to this uh, quite a bit better than I can. Uh, they did a study on, on the merits of amortization in 2020, and they did decide at that point in time that it was not the right time to reamortize. Um, but I would say that many pension plans across the country do reamortize um, these when you get within about 10 years of the maturity date. So it seems likely uh, that the CAPERS board might choose to reamortize at some point in the near future, anyways, as we near that 10 year mark or the 80% funded ratio. So the proposition to do it now pulls that forward by a couple of years. Uh, admittedly, uh, ahead of what they would um, have recommended last year. But it allows us to take advantage of freeing up the SGF today, and it allows us to take advantage of the more manageable contribution rates as we move, move forward today while we continue to be in this global pandemic. So we can wait for a couple of years and do it along the regular schedule once we hit that 80% funded ratio, if that's what they choose to do. Or we can pull that schedule up to now and, again, take advantage of the immediate benefits that are out there as we re-amortize CAPERS. With that, Mr. Chair, that does conclude my testimony. Um, I will touch on the fiscal note, if that's okay. And I'm, I'm going from memory here. Um, I think the first question is going to be, what is the total cost of this? I did talk a lot about the savings that we're going to realize, uh, $158 million the first year, up to $173, $174 million in a couple of years. It does extend the payments by 10 years. There is a cost with that. So the total contributions to the UAL over the course of 24 years under this plan versus the 14 remaining years is about $4.6 billion more than the current schedule. It's important to note that that's against the current schedule. So again, if we do go out and reamortize here in a couple of years, once we hit that 80% funded ratio, there's going to be a cost associated with that as well. I don't have that cost with me, but the true comparison of what the real cost of doing it now is would be to compare that against what the cost is against if we reamortize in a couple of years. So 4.6 billion does sound like a large number. It is a large number over a period of time, but again, that's not comparing to what uh, if we would re amortize in a couple of years. So we do realize immediate SGF savings for the first 14 years. Beyond that, it is um, SGF expenditures that we are not currently planning to have in the budget, but likely will at some point in time. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would stand for questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and covering the fiscal note as well. Uh, committee questions? Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming in front of us today. Uh, my concern has always been if we did nothing, what is our level of sustainability in the next couple of years to keep paying what we are doing now? I don't think we can maintain that in the budget without drastic changes. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Representative. It's as I mentioned during my testimony, um, it, we did miss payments in 2017 and 2019. I don't believe they were fully missed payments. They were reductions against the current, uh, or at that point, current schedule. The payments over the next couple of years do uh, approach a billion dollars that we'll have to contribute against the UAL. And that number, uh, quite honestly, as I look at the budget and the out years, that, that seems like a big chunk for us to undertake. Um, to reach a billion dollars under the reamortization, it's going to be many, many years before we hit that, and that's a large cliff that um, would be difficult to get to in the coming years. Um, I also spoke, I think, briefly with you yesterday and with uh, Mr. Conroy about looking at level payments, you know, and changing it a little bit in years and stuff. And uh, I will say that uh, thanks to Mr. Conroy. He has uh, written back with some numbers and things. And what is your feeling? Can you give the numbers on uh, what it would cost? Would it cost more to do level payments? Would it cost less to do level payments? Up front, it may be 
less, it'd be more later, or up front it's more, and then it's less. If it's all right with you, Madam Representative, I would prefer to let uh, Mr. Conroy answer to that question if he's okay with that and if the chair is um, okay. I, I just got the information that you gave me. Yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to review it once it's finalized and we have a okay. run, but I think Mr. Conroy would be far better suited to answer that. I'm sure he has it memorized. Thank you. I bet so. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And do we want to hold that for your testimony uh, later, or do you wish to answer that now, Director Conroy? Join us. Good afternoon, uh, committee. Uh, the request uh, was to look at uh, level dollar payments, which um, currently we're on a percent level of pay. So it escalates, it assumes salary, in salary increases go up. It's designed, it's kind of like an escalating mortgage on a house, while level dollar is probably closer to just a fixed mortgage rate, and that's that's what it is. Um, we did have our actuary uh, at Representative Neighbors request do some uh, calculations, um, and that would, um, uh, and I guess what the run we had to do was add 10 years on the amortization, but make it level dollar so that that amount is fixed. Um, and so that would start out uh, by saving about uh, the first year about $51 million, um, and then uh, as you, uh, then it increases uh, from there up to about $100 million until you get, of course, the closer you get to the adding on those 10 years, then it goes, goes the other, other way. Um, it, over the, uh, the savings in the first five years, though, if you want to focus on that, uh, under the governor's proposal, it saves $968 million in those first five years. Under this 24-year uh, level dollar, it saves $437 million from, from, the, from the baseline. And so, of course, again, you're adding 10 years, so there's costs associated with that. So hopefully that responds to your question. Thank you. And I just think it helps the committee to have something to compare to and uh, kind of a baseline. So that's why I had that done. And, and I thank the chairman for allowing me to do that. Thank you. Further questions, committee? Yeah. Representative Riley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure whether this is for director profit or for Alan, but is my thinking on the payment on how this plan is working, not counting the level payment plan, but what we're paying each year, the payments that we're due, is based on the amount of interest on that year. Is that correct? We're paying the interest every year until finally that interest is pay, uh, interest on the profit, on the, on the principal, right? And so that's why it's a sliding scale rather than a set, a set scale. So I'm kind of liking um, that solid payment schedule, just trying to get the, our uh, government to pay that kind of thing. I mean, it'd be that same kind of thing. I'd kind of like to go along with the, the David Ramsey process of what the governor is doing of maybe cutting back everything 10% cut back and get lean, that's what he would say. And then he would say, go after all those loans and double payment on all those loans. And so we would double payment the interest until we finally paid them off early rather than paying them off in 14 years or 24 years. So at this point, you know, I don't see the point of going to 24. I would rather go with seven. So just passing that on, thank you. <laughs> I think he would also start that by saying beans and rice, rice and beans, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I do have a response, if that's okay. Uh, and thank you to Mr. Conroy for being willing to step up here and explain that. Um, I, I just got the printout, so I've, I've not yet studied it. Um, I, I would also mention, going back to my opening remarks, um, the current, this House Bill 2399 does reflect what the governor's budget recommendation shows. Um, so again, we, there were many cuts to many agencies to try to stay lean, try to preserve some of the core services and fund what we thought was absolutely necessary for Kansans across the state. 
um, and also try to maintain that 7.5% ending balance that is required by statute. So any deviation from the current bill, House Bill 2399, albeit still a savings with this level dollar reamortization over 24 years, does leave a gap of about $100 million uh, of ending balance for us to consider. Uh, just, just put that out there for the, the committees um, to noodle on. Thank you. Representative Neighbor. And I would go back. The reason I had done this because I had some concern about sustainability, but when we look at what Mr. Conroy brought back to us, um, I think this, the sustainability issue comes back to me. And uh, the uh, stable payment sounds good, but we have so many things that we have to address right now. And um, some of those I know we've all been through a lot of with the Department of Labor. We have got aging, aging equipment that if we cut, we're only uh, hurting Kansans across the state. That's not something that's going to go in their pocket. It's something that we're going to have to pay. And um, I, th I, I think there are a lot of discussions to be had on this issue. It's not an easy issue, but I, it's kind of like pay now or pay later. And uh, I know it was turned down last year, but um, we are making some strides. Uh, but we've got a lot more strides to make. And I think rather than going and cutting everything, 10%, 5%, whatever it may be, are we putting ourselves in a no-win situation? That's my concern. And I think we will be at a level if we don't do something where we can't afford to pay any of it until then we're in fault. And that's not what we want to do. So thank you. And just that was my rationale. Thank you. Other questions, committee? Representative Dodson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of points. Um, can you uh, opine why we were unable to pay the bills? Are you referencing the fiscal 17 and fiscal 19 right. mispayments? Um, I, I could opine. I would say uh, there were some revenue shortfalls in those years uh, that we were trying to make up, and I believe that was one tool uh, in the budget toolbox to be able to uh, have some cash flow. I guess I'm trying to equate this to my own budget, maybe. That would be one that I'd probably pay. Uh, second, uh, is this like a mortgage? In other words, if I've got a, a mortgage today at 5.5 uh, .5 and I want a new mortgage because I want lower monthly payments, so I go down and shop around and I get a 2.75. So my monthly payments are way down, but I only had 12 years left on the mortgage and now I've got 18 more. Is this about the same thing we're doing? Uh, I would say that's a, a fair analogy outside of the uh, three-point uh, savings that you're getting there. I, I don't see a three percentage point savings on this reamortization. It's truly just extending uh, the time frame by which we're going to repay it. So it'll be the same percentage, just extending it yeah. for cash flow purposes. But in this case, in your case, you end up paying more money. Yes, in the long run, yes, sir. Okay. I was trying to do just some quick math there. I mean, we had 40-year initial, which took us out to 2036, I think. Is that right from 2035? So in that, I think you had the amount under that curve to be $13 billion or something. And then this one, which went back to 2021, came forward, <clears throat> was uh, $4.6 billion. So I was trying to figure out if we were getting um, some kind of an interest savings that we ought to be aware of there. I mean, is that the implication that you're getting a better rate now? Uh, no, sir, I, I would say, and again, Mr. Conroy will, will certainly be capable of correcting me if I misspeak, but um, it, it's less about the interest savings because I do not believe there would be an interest savings. And it's more about free cash flow today yeah. when we're in a budget crunch today, you know, things are, uh, we're needing it right now. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Further questions? I, I have a few, so I'll, I'll uh, take, take a minute or two along the way. Um, and, and there are some things that we agree on, so maybe I'll actually start towards the end and, and work back up. Um, 
I do agree that at some point it makes sense to reamortize in that particularly with a level percent of payroll amortization, which sets those increasing payments not only on the interest cost, but on an assumption that payroll increases over time, both by the number hired and the rate at which they're paid. So it makes your payments at the end of the amortization period meaningfully higher than at the beginning of the amortization period. So for example, should CAPERS do something like lower their assumed investment rate of return to something like, oh, just to see if I can make the director's uh, eyes get big, 5%. <laughs> that would be a huge new liability that we hadn't anticipated. And it would be common to do a level percent of payroll amortization to ease into that, but figure out how you're going to eat that elephant over time. Um, the discussion that was brought up here, where we're looking at a liability that we already know, one of our challenges in reamortizing using the same method is it lowers those payments initially, and again, gets to a larger payment further out. Um, the level payment is one that does intrigue me at the time that the board might direct us to look at when we want to shave that mountaintop off, because uh, I would readily agree and grant that going to a billion dollars and then down to under a hundred million the next year is not a direction we'd want to go long term. So it, it is a topic for the board to continue to look at and figure out. As I look at this one, right now, uh, you'd shown that we would be scheduled to pay 658 million, and that would go to 499 million. Are, are you aware of a number that we refer to, back to Representative Riley's point, of what the interest rate and the cost of a year of service is? So what the incremental cost for a year is, is that a number that's loaded through your office? Uh, I do not have that with me right now. No, sir. I'm sorry. And, and there's no reason it necessarily should. It's one that I bother the director for, and it's $626 million. So that's our what we kind of call our steady state number, $626 million. And the director can correct me if I'm materially off on that. But for many years, and uh, I really thank another conferee who is here to give us history, and history is important. I'm sorry to dwell on it too long. But when I got here in 2010, we were hoping to get to 300 million annual payment on CAPERS. And it looked difficult and it was not nearly sufficient to meet it. And we saw that mountain that we had to climb. So now you see we're at 658 million, which is materially different than that one. Uh, but that's how that schedule was, was, was set in that growth over time. Um, but 626 is where we tread water. So a dollar more than that pays a little bit of principal, gets past the interest, and a dollar less than that goes the other way and would be what we refer to as negative amortization. So, so then as I worked through that, that's where I wanted to get a sense. Um, we've gotten to 658, which is 42 million above that steady state. And I think as we look towards eventually looking at level amortization, We'd look at how much of that principal do we want to pay off each year so that if we're going to do it over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, we knock it down. But it's, it's going to be something like a mortgage that we start slowly paying down so it's gone over time. And I have a hesitancy to go to that. And that's why the question related to that steady state number and I'm making more of a statement, but if you have something in response to the negative amortization, I'd welcome that. Uh, I, I do not, okay. Mr. Chair. There is negative thank amortization you. with this one. You are correct for the first so, one. So thank you. And that would go on for maybe the first 10 years, and then it would turn back positive? I was trying to track the numbers here. It's, it's between 8 and 11. My number's over there. Okay. By the time, and then... And so we'd build for a while, and then we'd get back to reducing the debt. So that was a concern that I had. You mentioned the missed payments. Um, can you refresh my memory on what the missed payment was in 2019? I don't remember each of the years. I know between the two years, it was $258 million. Um, I think one was about two-thirds of that, and the other was about a third. Um, so what we did with the missed payments then is we included what's called a layering payment, and it is on a level uh, dollar of $25.8 million over a period of time. 
So thank you. And yeah, I was not a fan of layering, and we did it a number of times. So I'm, I'm willing to criticize that with you also. And there were missed payments. If my recollection is correct in 19, and I'll look to the director, um, while there was a layered payment that may have been missed in that, we did make the actuarial payment. And in addition, I think we paid off a partial layering and a full layering. So I think the total payments in 2019 were 859 million uh, north of the number. So while it may be possible to be correct in saying there is a missed payment, my interest over time has been how many total dollars get into the fund. And if I should have had another 6 million for the missed payment on the layering to be around 865 million rather than 859, that'd be great. But I'd rather get 859 in missing a 6 million payment than asking for 499 and getting it. So uh, that is my concern on the, on the payments. Representative Neighbor. Uh, I was on general government budget when some of those things were being looked at. And uh, it was done in quarters. And so in certain quarters, the amount that should have been spent or paid was not spent. And CAPERS funds then were used as a bank for the general budget. And so a lot of those things, I think, have built interest over time, those payments, because they weren't totally done or we didn't have all of it done. And it happened for about three and a half to four years. So there, we caught up with 16, 17, but we had not, I think there was even one missed in 17 that was left over, I'm not sure, but 18 and 19, I know. We just didn't do it. And we, uh, we did offer to have that done on a quicker basis, but appropriations denied that funding. So. So, and I'll also grant that there are other years prior to 17 that might have been more egregious misses. Um, I'll actually uh, argue further on 19, but I won't take the committee's time with it at the moment. So, <laughs> but, but thank you on that. Um, the point, many plans do reamortize, and that's true, and, and it will make sense for ours at some point. As I've observed other plans, I have seen them do similar things where they do reamortize and they do a new level percent of payroll amortization. And I would argue that's a model that we may not want to follow of, of the negative amortization and, and the proverbial kicking the can where that grows further on. But while that does exist, I don't know that that's one that I would want. But um, another point you made that I do agree with, so reamortize at some point, the level dollar, I think at some point makes sense. And we do have to compare the cost to the eventual reamortization because I do believe even if it's three years before the last thing that at some point we level that off and we don't just go over a ginormous cliff and there would be some cost to that. Uh, nonetheless, my other concerns would be, would be larger. So, but thank you for that. Are there any other questions? Representative Howe. Mr. Chairman. I um, appreciate the chance to ask a few questions. Um, so uh, how would this affect intergenerational equity? And by that, I mean, you know, the perpetual kicking the can down the road to future taxpayers. Um, what types of things did you look at as you considered this amortization proposal as it relates to, you know, future taxpayers of Kansas? Thank you for the question, uh, Representative. I would, I would start by saying, and I, I know you didn't ask this, but I want to make sure I'm clear because I, I miss it in my remarks, that um, for starters, by re-amortizing, um, th there is no impact on member benefits, uh, either current retirees or future retirees as we see it. Um, so that would be, you know, I want to make sure that we allay any concerns on that front. As it relates to uh, generations down the road, um, Yes, there are going to be, again, financial commitments beyond the uh, original end date of this, the current amortization schedule. Um, again, if the board chooses to reamortize here in a couple of years, those are going to exist at some level as well. Um, and if you kind of extrapolate out what SGF or, or the uh, state revenues are right now and what this, the, the payments against the schedule are, 
it doesn't appear as though the CAPERS contributions grow as a percent to SGF or uh, state revenues over time. Uh, thank you for the response. Um, also, I had a question about uh, to Mr. Conroy, if you will, about how this would affect uh, Tier 3 CAPERS uh, people. Um, on terms of impact on CAPERS 3, I, I, I do not believe it would it would make uh, it would not be a material impact on capers three membership the plan design on that uh, is such that really the employee co the employee contributions come uh, carry almost all of the actuarial cost of the benefit plan design in in capers capers three so this would not um, uh, reamortizing or not again would not impact uh, benefits uh, of active or retired people. And of course, in terms of pension funding, the risk is all to the employer. So whatever the employees contribute, whatever investment income comes in, and then the plug factor is the employer contributions. Hope that helps. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Conroy and Mr. Profit for your uh, time today. Thank you, Representative. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Representative Prophet, for spending time with us, et cetera. And uh, based on what I think I remember from last year, I, th I think you got off fairly easy on that, except I, I did a disservice. I should have had uh, Director Conroy's informational piece so you didn't have to answer all of our other questions as I jumped into the uh, uh, fiscal note details, but thank you. For Quite all right. Thank you for the time. Committee. Is there anyone else wishing to appear as a proponent? Seeing none, I would like to step back to the informational and then welcome our opponent testimony after that. So if we can shift from Director Profit to Director Conroy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. Uh, and I guess clearly, not only is Mr. Prophet a budget director, I believe he'd also qualify as an actuary too. So I, my hat's off to him in terms of wading through uh, all of this uh, caper, capers information. Um, and I guess I'd just maybe also comment that uh, maybe capers employer contributions up until this year has been on a diet of rice and beans or beans and rice um, since they've not been at the actuarial required rate. But uh, the governor in her recommendation today for this year's budget um, after 25 years gets us to that actuarial required rate. So that's certainly uh, progress. And then if I could circle back to Representative Neighbor, I did, uh, as I was uh, set back down there, just in terms of that level dollar payment, just to give you, uh, in terms of total contributions, as was talked about, we're currently around 700 million and eventually, of course, going out 15 years and there'll be lots of inflation and things changing over 15 years, but the current estimates, you know, to get it over $900 million. Level dollar of pay then would get it uh, down to about 660 million. And there it fluctuates a little bit because of assumed some demographic changes, but it's gonna stay in that $600 million range all the way out over, um, you know, uh, adding over the next 24 years. So that is sort of the magic of level dollars. It, it caps it, it is like a fixed house payment. And so it, it uh, draws, draws that down. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, and I've, I've got some uh, rather detailed uh, testimony that has lots of good information and some graphs uh, that show the tsunami of the unfunded actuarial liability if you re-amortize that $4.6 billion. Um, uh, so that's all there. But uh, in my written testimony, there's just a, there a two-pager high-level kind of policy. It's the last two pages of my written testimony that looks at uh, CAPERS funding policy. And just to, uh, just to give you that, uh, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, an unfunded, uh, uh, unfunded actuary liability is not a bad thing. It's part of pension funding. It's part of plan design. It's assumed that it will, will be there. 
course, certainly um, it's larger than we would like, and there's you know lots of reasons uh, for that. Um, you know, there have been those missed or lower than actuarial required contributions, which is really the largest single factor. Of course, some big down market downturns in 2001 and 2008. There were some uh, unfunded benefit enhancements and certainly some actuarial assumption changes uh, through through the years. So, um, again, as was indicated, the Board of Trustees periodically reviews reviews the amortization schedule as they do all of the actuarial uh, assumptions and investment uh, policies, and they do that currently every uh, every three three years. Um, and so uh, I guess amortization, as I like to say, is not a four-letter word. There's nothing wrong with it. Again, it's part of uh, solid pension funding. But this amortization that we have or this unfunded actuary liability we have um, started in 1993, 40-year period has been discussed. It's a level percent of pay. Uh, it's a, you know it's certainly a, a, a sound uh, actuarial methodology, but um, it is that point. You start out low and you go high. Is, and that was one of the decisions, of course, in 1993 when there were substantial, significant benefit increases. The legislature at that time decided that the employer would pay all that. They could have asked the employees for additional contributions, but the decision was all employer financed, um, and it would all. Um, and so, to keep the cost down, um, that was one of the decisions uh, to go to level level percent of pay. Amortization is currently a, a delegated board of trustees uh, responsibility. The legislature. Uh, delegated that to the board in 2004. It's really about a year-long process uh, uh, where they look at the asset liabilities. Uh, uh, they do an asset liability study on the investment, which is the first six months. In the last six months, they look at all the actuarial information, the demographics, um, and all of that to finally come up to. And amortization is only one part of that study. Uh, you know, demographics, salaries, uh, the uh, and assumed rate of return on the investments are all part of that that study. Um, and again, it's very important. You know, we, we probably can't say it enough. Amortization, reamortization does not impact uh, Capers retiree their benefits. They are safe. They are sound, and, and they will continue to be to be paid. Um, again, uh, periodically it will be studied. The closer you get to paying it off, there's there can be lots of volatility from one year to the next. So if you get within that 10-year window, again, the employer contribution is that plug factor. And so you've got to, so there could be big swings, not only for the state, but all for all those 1,500 local units of government uh, out there um, as, you know, if there's a big downturn in the market, the employer contribution rate would, would go up considerably because now you only have 10 years or eight years or seven years to get to you to that point of extinguishing it around 2033, 20, 2035. The governor's proposal adds those 10 years, as you've talked, under the current plan, it adds uh, $4.6 billion to that. Um, again, I don't know whether it's, you know, that's um, might be a little apples to oranges, because again, presumably the Board of Trustees will look at reamortization here in the near future. And, and so, um, Clearly, there will be costs associated with that, depending on what, what they would do. Um, they may look at some other things other than just uh, adding on 10, 10 years. So that $4.6 million figure uh, clearly would be, if you're comparing to what the board might eventually do, maybe in a couple years to current law, uh, clearly there would be a cost there, and, and it would eat into that $4.6 um, $6 billion. But the point of doing it now is, you know, we're at 70% funded. Again, great progress. We were at state school, we were at 56% funded back in 2012. There's been yeoman's work in terms of the legislature improving that funding, increased employer contributions, uh, uh, keepers three uh, uh, billion dollars in pension obligation bonds. Um, all of that on that steady march to improve that funding, and, and that's gotten us to that 70%. This uh, would slow down, I believe, that, 
that progress some, I guess the chart there on that very last page, currently with all the assumptions, we're supposed to get to 80% in 2026. This would push it out to 2034. So it slows it down. And again, you're, the lower the funded ratio, the more susceptible you are to um, uh, you know, swings in, in the uh, economy or in the, in the market. So um, I think uh, Representative Neighbor may have mentioned the magic words, it's kind of pay me now or pay me even more later. Uh, it does save um, you know, $968 million under the governor's proposal in the next five years, which is a considerable amount. Um, but of course, again, like that mortgage on the house, pay less now, you pay more um, later. Um, anyway, I know there's some other good conferees and, and be glad to respond to any questions, but um, glad, glad to do that at the appropriate time. Thank you, Director Conroy. I, you may have mentioned it and I, I didn't completely catch it. Did the, did the board weigh in with any communication that is appropriate to share? Um, they, they did, uh, and basically it was stay the course. Um, and it was sort of like re will happen, but I think their position would be, it'd be better if the funding position of CAPERS was stronger, that we were closer to or at, or let's say that 80% figure on the way to 100. 80% is not the stopping point, of course, but we wanna to get to the 100%. But the board did send a letter to the governor and to the legislative leadership um, suggesting that um, perhaps now is not the best time for reamortization. Thank you. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regard to that last question, the board doesn't have to consider themselves with SGF issues, do they? They do not. Thank you. Yep. Further questions, committee? Representative Dodson. Mr. Chair, uh, I was looking at the uh, contributions chart that you had in here, the one that either from the state or from the uh, employer. The uh, blue line, you know, we hit 800 million on that blue line in 2028, and then it goes to something 980, 990 million. Now, the only thing that that red line does is push that out about 11 years. But I mean, you get back to the same place. You get an 800 million uh, line, and then you get 980 million or so near the end of its uh, amortization. So I'm wondering, getting back to the chair's uh, comment earlier, uh, if there isn't a schedule that's someplace between, if you look back into 2023 or something, if there isn't a, a rate back in there where between that red and blue line that pulls down the end so that you don't get, let's say you don't make it back to more than about 850 million. If if that happens and, and you don't, and in terms of those employer contributions stay less right. than that, uh, that's right. Well, then under the current methodology, you know, it will just keep adding on. That line really would continue to go up, and it would be something higher than the nine hundred million dollars under the current schedule of pushing it out uh, ten years and and being at that. What so. I meant is if they contributed more between these two oh, lines. Uh, and that's, that's a great thing. And yes, uh, CAPERS is always open uh, uh, for that kind of business. Uh, and the legislature has, as was indicated, there have been some sort of uh, catch-up payments, I guess, that were made uh, here several years ago that helped close that gap. The pension bonds helped close that gap. Um, that's right. So it, it spins it down. Um, and again, the actual assumption, everything that's not paid the assumption is we're charging our going rate of 7.75 percent. Right. So, thank you very much. Further questions, committee? And, and thanks for that discussion and the charts that you have. Give us a chance to look at that and if there was a way to just level that off because it does show and, and the scale kind of collapses it a little. Uh, there is that mountain and a cliff and um, would agree that if we can smooth that out in the future, uh, that would be something that we yeah. would look at. 
I'm sorry, in the graphs there and all that testimony, there is one, but you can see it just shifts it, you know, out 10 years and it stays up high and then it goes, goes down. So thank you, Director Conroy, for the information as always. Um, with that, we will move to our first opponent and would welcome to the committee, Jerry Betker, former CAPERS trustee, leader across the state, and thank you for taking time to come back to the committee. Tell us just a little bit so that we can appreciate why you're here. I don't think you're a lobbyist. I don't think anybody pays you. <laughs> No, <laughs> but you know, I've got quite a bit invested uh, in, uh, in this operation in terms of time and hours spent in the past. Uh, the interesting thing to me is these issues do not go away. Uh, the, you know, they may be lesser or worse or less, you know, more serious here and less serious there, uh, but they simply do not go away. Uh, just a little bit of background and history on myself. Uh, I am a Kansas native. Uh, I grew, I born and grew up at Beloit, Kansas. Uh, I have a nuclear engineering degree from Kansas State. Uh, I didn't want to be able to spend the rest of my life in a laboratory, uh, so I decided I didn't want to do that. I went to master. I went to uh, uh, graduate school uh, at MIT and uh, got something, I got a master's degree in something called industrial management. Uh, then I took, then I, I took a real fork in, uh, in the road and uh, took a job in New York City uh, with a brokerage firm and got in the investment business and that was my home for 17 years in New York and in, and in Kansas City. That led me to a series of financially uh, related uh, time, time spent, and so forth. And so I'm a director of a bank, for example, now. Uh, but I, I did, did, as regards to, uh, oh, just one other thing I wanted to say. I have a, a fairly long history at K-State uh, as a volunteer on the, in the Alumni Association, the Foundation, uh, and so forth. And so I am following that part of your mission uh, as closely as I can, too, because these are indeed difficult times uh, for everyone with some tough decisions that are going to have to be made. Anyway, uh, and, and one more thing about K-State. Here is an opportunity that a lot of people don't know even exists. If you're over 60 and can get the permission of, a, of a, the professor, you can take a class. I've taken 17 of them, and I loved it. Uh, you know Barry Flinchball? The name is familiar to some of you anyway. Okay. Well, I took Barry. I know somehow or other I knew Barry, and uh, I was taking his class, and I was sitting clear up in the, in the corner. It's a classic lecture class, 115 students, and I had broken my ankle, uh, fell out of a tree, believe it or not, uh, and I was, so I was sitting clear in the back of the room because I had to have a little knee thing, or put my knee in to get around. And so anyway, uh, one of the students asked her, asked Dr. Flinchball, said, asked him a question down the front. He didn't, he paused and he says, you know, I don't know. He says, why don't you ask that old man up there in the corner? And let me tell you, the students love that. Uh, and let's see, Barry's just, he's gone now. Uh, I, I think he, we have lost a, uh, it doesn't mean anything to the subject matter today, and I'll, so I'll just get, get away from that. Uh, anyway, I was, been, I was appointed as trustee uh, initially by Governor Finney, uh, and then by four or three other governors, so I went through over a period of 17 years. Uh, we were dealing with a lot of, we meaning the trustees, uh, we're dealing with a lot of uh, lawsuits and stuff like that in the early 1990s, uh, and I became a part of that, and uh, most of that was resolved with an awful lot of discussion, but not a lot of real progress. Um, so I think that's an unfortunate period of Caper's history. I was appointed uh, to the Board of Regents in 2008, and uh, actually served in both capacities, trustee in, in, of CAPERS and Regents as, as a, for one year, 
uh, then my term ran out, uh, and I was a chairperson of the audit committee. Uh, one other personal note, I was involved with KBA, uh, Kansas, Kansas Bioscience Authority, which you may or may not have recalled. They've been gone for a while now. Uh, the, I was chair of the audit committee. I was interviewed extensively by uh, in, investigative type auditors. Uh, they didn't find anything, uh, but nevertheless, uh, K, or KBA disappeared, which I think is really, it's a very long story and I don't want to go any forth. But uh, there we get, now we get to capers. Uh, it is very important to have a sense of history on capers. It's not easily acquired. It doesn't mean that you don't have biases. Uh, and I think we all do, but capers, this is deja vu. This is uh, all over again uh, for me. Uh, this is, these funding issues have been addressed uh, or tried to address, and actually the plan that op the system's operating under now uh, was put together, I think, I hope I'm right here, in 2012. And uh, that was a real, and I testified for that bill, by the way. Uh, it, it was a watershed event uh, because it really mapped out the future, which for the, and many people don't want to talk about. They don't want, they want to talk about next month or or whatever, and if you're in politics, maybe next year, or the election, or whatever, whatever is going to happen. But the the, uh, the it just it just goes on and on and on, and it's kind of like so. What else is new? Uh, there's this not history. We have a long list of failures of the legislature to adequately fund the pan. We have a long history of a whole series of governors. Some did a little more. Some did a little less. Uh, but the, the pattern was the, uh, was the same. It's easy to, and, and oh, it may be, let me try to correct one thing that I think yeah, I see in the newspaper as much as anything, but uh, you are not saving money by putting something off. You're just increasing the bill for somebody down the road. I, I motivated me to, you know, you can get this on the computers now, but I, I, this is my uh, uh, math uh, table book that I had when I was in school at K-State. And uh, interestingly, one of the things, it was published in the 1950s, actually. Uh, and one of the interesting things in there is that the compound interest table ends at 7%. It doesn't go beyond 7. It stops. Because at that time period, that was a high rate. Well, rates aren't that high today, you know, I'd certainly admit, but they were pretty quite a bit layer higher not too long ago. And so I don't think we want to get lulled to sleep in any way just because market interest rates are historically low. They are. Now, can we survive? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we've got a very good person, I think, at the Federal Reserve, uh, and, and support El Treasure, Janet Yellen is, is, is Secretary of Treasury, uh, is, is, is an enormous asset, but still, uh, this is just not a new story. We have a whole long list of failures of the legislature to ad adequately fund the plan. Perhaps sometimes the governor is involved more or less. Uh, it, just, it just isn't, isn't new. And uh, so we're, the funding ratio has, as Alan pointed out, the funding ratio has improved. Uh, you're still ahead at, not too many years ago, Kansas was the ranked 49th in terms of funded ratio of their retirement systems. Second only to the state of Illinois. Uh, the state of Illinois is technically, anyway, bankrupt. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you know, there are some other things. So that's a whole other story. Um, the governor had a similar proposal a year ago. That uh, bill did not make it. Uh, not uh, spending, oh, just in my illustration, I forgot. 7% uh, compound interest rate over 20 years, uh, a dollar, interest on a dollar. What is it cumulatively? Huh? It's almost five. So you save a dollar today 
and you spend five 20 years from now. Now, what kind of responsibility is that? I think the legislature does have a responsibility to consider possible future outcomes. So, uh, but it, it's just not going to help. So uh, you're not going to save any money. You just kick it down the road. Uh, our time horizons are all too frequently too short. Uh, I think we really have to make sure that we have a consideration of the long-term impact on funding CAPERS. Uh, that exceeds short-term funding needs uh, very significantly, and my recommendation is to vote no. Thank you. Any, uh, any questions you might have? Uh, oh, by the way, I'd like to compliment uh, Alan uh, and the actuary, I have suggested, I don't know whether it's ever been done. You ever had the actuary come? You have here? Not for a long time. Well, anyway, uh, it was a lady at the time. Is it still her? Whew. She's smart. You won't take you very long to figure that out. <laughs> uh, anyway, that would be my recommendation. You might consider that uh, option sometime in the future. Questions? Any? So thank you for coming. Thank you. We do have a few questions. I want to thank you for coming, for just paying attention to this issue and being motivated to take time out of your day to come here. And also to thank you for serving on the CAPERS board from 91 to 2008. That's a long term. Yes, it is. And we appreciate your history and the perspective that's there. It's, you know, we the, appreciate all of the perspectives that are there, but thank you for coming. The, uh, uh, I have one little uh, personal story. We were involved in a few lawsuits and so forth. I have had my deposition taken by the attorneys for the other side. And, uh, and the, the attorney uh, spent the whole morning uh, interview, tech, interviewing me on what, I, uh, what I, my qualifications and so forth and so on. And then we went to lunch and came back. And he says, okay, I think we, we you know, got through that now. He says, I think I now understand why the governor uh, chose to appoint you. What I don't know is why did you want to do it? And I said, the first thing came to my head, you know, frankly, uh, I said, I thought it might be fun. He said, the next, his, where his next words were, this, God knows how expensive an attorney, uh, said, that's all the questions I have for this witness. He didn't go anywhere. So my suggestion would be, if you're ever trapped in a deposition like that, tell the truth. Sometimes it works. It did for me. Thank you. A couple of questions. We'll start with oh, Representative okay. Proctor and then Miller. Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank, you, thank you, sir, for, for your testimony. It was really, really powerful. Um, I think that you laid out in really stark terms the the financial irresponsibility of kicking the can down the road and taking out a loan on the bank at Capers. Um, I wonder if you could take just a moment, I mean, because you've just got this incredible lifetime of public service, uh, just to speak to the kind of the, the moral responsibility uh, that we have to all those public retirees uh, in the future uh, to keep this system sound. Well, I had one personal experience I'd use as an example. Uh, it's tried to be active at the, I live in Manhattan, by the way, now. Uh, we're very delighted to have you there, by the way. Um, but anyway, uh, I, w I was on, on the Capers board uh, when we still lived in Beloit. We moved down here uh, in 2008. But uh, I periodically went to the teachers. Uh, they had monthly meetings and so forth and so on. And I said they, they said the concern was, that it was ill-founded, but the concern was still there. Uh, the teachers were concerned about a, the, their uh, retirement benefit being cut. And uh, I said, I don't think that's going to happen. And they said, well, why do you say that? I says, well, number one, there's a provision in the state constitution. And number two, I, if that would happen, I'm going to contact my friends and ex-cohorts in the investment business, and we're going to build a new condo uh, building in Topeka for all the trial lawyers that are going to move here. 
because that's <laughs> so I say it's just not going to happen, you know. But but the publicity every once in a while, unfortunately, can get twisted and misunderstood, uh, so that they, you know you can actually frighten them. Uh, a, a retired teacher has been retired for ten years or something like that, and say, well, you know, what if they? What's going? What are they? Are they going to cut my benefit? The answer to that is no. Thank you, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too want to thank you for your testimony. Congratulate you for your public service. Uh, I knew Dr. Flinchball pretty well. He was more of an entertainer than he was a professor. I think. <laughs> uh, your illustration of borrowing a dollar ended up ending up costing you five. Would you suggest that no one buy a home unless they can pay cash? Say that again. I'm sorry. Would you suggest, based on your illustration, that you borrow a dollar, you end up spending five? But would you suggest then that no one buy a home unless they can pay cash for it? No. No, I would not. And yet, uh, it's, and yet. It's, there are rules in extensively more rigid than involve mortgage, getting to get a mortgage, not having to pay cash. I, not, I'm, I don't, I'm not against borrowing money. I'm not against it, but, but the, the, uh, part of the answer is you, it's, you got to have a whole series of things and assumptions that are made about your ability to pay and what the penalties are if you don't, uh, what the benefits are if you pay it early, which sometimes, I, 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 had a, I tell you, the, my nicest personal day ever was in about 1998, I think, or 99 or some other. I paid off my house mortgage. But, but, but the I was same, glad to get rid of it. The same thing is true, however, that when you take a long-term loan to purchase a home, it's going to, over time, the total is going to cost you substantially more than if you paid cash. But oh, of course. But there are situations where that's just not possible. Or else no one would, could buy a home. if they No had. one could buy a home. Right. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for taking uh, the time. You got, thank you very much. Uh, our next opponent, Ernie Claudel, a current trustee. So we thank him also for his service as a trustee, although he'll have to disclaim that before continuing with his testimony. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see there, and as I said before, I, I lobby for the uh, Kansas Coalition of Public Retirees and the uh, Kansas Association of Retired School Personnel. Um, I have to say the disclaimer that uh, I am an elected member of the Board of Trustees, uh, but the positions expressed in this testimony are mine and those of CARSP and KCPR. They are not in any way represent the views of the Capers Board of Trustees, nor do I speak to them. I would, <clears throat> I would uh, the last time that we testified against this bill, my predecessor here, uh, I did not get to hear him uh, at that time, and I, w I was, because uh, uh, I had to go on, and uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I thank you very much for your service. This is my eighth year as a, a trustee elected school, and uh, I have been what I call chasing capers since 2004. I got interested in it. Uh, because I was at, at a point a licensed uh, security uh, salesman and I uh, spent uh, 33 years in the public schools in the classroom and in, as a building administrator. And I got interested in, in this, this stuff and I, I, do, I just couldn't get ever get away from it. I would, uh, we would oppose and I would oppose this, uh, this idea of reamortization at this point. Um, it has been stated that it would cost $4.6 billion more over time, extend 10 years. Uh, what this bill does is pass is it starts the underfunding of CAPERS all over again. And that is the, the UAL, the Unfunded Actuarial Liability, is actually the elephant in the room and the main cost cause of that is is the 
failure to meet the actuarial contribution over time. Uh, in fact, the normal cost, if that was not for that debt, uh, that legacy debt, the normal cost to you uh, to the state on their part of the keepers employer contribution would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 million dollars, as opposed to the 700 and whatever we're talking about now. That's that's what that does. This this would start that all over again. Uh, my perspective, of course, in all this is is from the employer employee's position. Um, uh, and I'm I'm really concerned. The action uh, moves the 80% funding if this was approved, and I thought it was from 2029 to 2036. I thought I heard the director say today 2044. Whatever it is, it's a long time. Uh, the uh, we have never uh, employees under Capers one and two have have uh, truly uh, been uh, compensated what they were promised, but they've never really realized uh, uh, been able to realize uh, any any profit, if you will, from from their investment, which has always been constant. Uh, uh, I also mentioned in previous testimony that uh, uh, we are interested, of course, in the COLA and uh, <clears throat> this this 80% goal, whether it is uh, comes into 2029 as is suspected or would be improved by other contributions. Uh, the last excuse uh, or explanation for not uh, considering that uh, call for us was that it was not 80% funded. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, the other thing I have concern about quite honestly is um, I have heard a question. Um, to my knowledge, uh, I've tried to explain this uh, to the powers to be, but I, I I've not heard any kind of question about anybody's future in capers except for the tier three today. That question was 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 uh, given and and I haven't heard I haven't heard uh, anybody else uh, be concerned about the capers uh, people. And if I and if you were and I misunderstood what you said, I apologize for that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the actuary provided us with figures. Uh, uh, I believe it was last year that it it would uh, um, I guess a common thought would be if there was less to pay, even though it was a longer time, it would more likely be paid. And uh, apparently, the actuary shares with us shared with us that the statistics actually are the probability of the uh, payment being made uh, is a question of time. I mean, of amount of time, it's not an amount. In other words, the longer it takes to pay off something, the less likely it is to be paid off, uh, uh, statistics say. Uh, for those reasons, um, I, uh, I, I'm vehemently opposed to uh, reamortizing this. Um, I think uh, that uh, the CAPERS is an extremely complex system which uh, my previous uh, uh, the previous gentleman there stated and uh, and uh, it, it, it it it's been uh, moving in the right direction uh, from the last uh, in the last several years and I I don't think we can uh, I don't I don't think it's uh, wise uh, to put that progress in jeopardy by uh, by starting the asunder funding all over again and I'd be happy to stand for questions. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and the committee for listening. For your testimony, are there questions, committee? Seeing none, oh, Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Claudel, for uh, coming in and uh, testifying today. I, 
I'm very, very, very concerned about those CAPERS 1, 2, and Tier 3 uh, beneficiaries. So um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk specifically uh, just about how this is going to impact uh, those, those uh, earlier CAPERS program members. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I am, uh, I am not sure, but I know uh, we are leading the United States in not having any kind of a benefit increase. And like I said, I have, I won't bore you with all the stories, but the last, uh, I was told very directly that uh, we weren't going to talk about this until we reach eighty percent. If, if this were done, I don't know when the 80% would ever arise again. Uh, and so it's been 23 years, uh, 20, depending on the last total uh, program-wide benefit increase that was permanent was active in 97. So however, and the, the bill was actually 98. So however you calculate that, 23, 24 years since there's 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 been a, a, any kind of benefit increase. Prior to that time, there was 16, and there was also five bonuses. And uh, and uh, the our best estimate is that uh, uh, we've lost 20, 54 percent of our buying power over that period of time. I hope that answers your question, sir, and thank you. It does, thank you. Any further questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony and for taking time to join the committee. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to appear as an opponent of House Bill 2399? And anyone neutral? Or anyone else at all on 2399? Hearing none, we will close the hearing. Thanks to everyone for participating. Committee, thank you for your attention. I realize I have not managed our time and questions well. We still have most of our business ahead of us and our time is up. I hope that everyone is able to continue uh, to hang with us. Uh, for the sake of our conferees, I would like to move to our other hearing, which is House Bill 2218. After that, I have uh, two or three bills that I do want us to work, one of them being 2218. Um, so we will work through that process, but we'll open the hearing on 2218 and ask for an overview from the reviser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, committee. House Bill 2218 changes the membership of the Kansas State Employees Healthcare Commission, and it amends KSA 75-6502. Um, as a, Section 1 amends the statute pertaining to the composition of the Kansas State Employees Health Care Commission. Under current law, the commission is comprised of five members, uh, the Commissioner of Insurance, the Secretary of Admi Administration, a current state employee in the classified service under the Can Kansas Civil Service Act who is appointed by the governor, a person who retired from a position in the classified service under the Kansas Civil Service Act who is appointed by the governor, and a representative of the general public who is appointed by the governor. The bill would change the requirements of the current state employee from being a current employee in the classified service to being a current employee who is currently enrolled in the group medical insurance plan of the state health care benefits program. And the bill would also change the requirements of the retired employee from being an individual who retired from the classified service to being an individual who retired from state service and who is currently enrolled in the group medical insurance plan of the state health care benefits program. And I can stand for questions. Thank you, Reviser. Are there questions for the Reviser? Hearing none, thank you for the overview. The fiscal note is also uh, uh, insignificant, so we will move to our proponent testimony and welcome Natalie Yoza with the, uh, the president of the State Health Plan Employee Advisory Committee. Thank you for your patience to stay with committee. Hi, um, my name is Natalie Yoza. Can you hear me? 
There, there's my video. Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> I am a state employee and I am currently serving as president of the Employee Advisory Committee. The Healthcare Commission established our group, which we call the EAC, um, to help them develop policy surrounding the state employees health plan. We have 18 active state employee members and three retirees. And our directive when we're looking for membership um, is to try to get as diverse as we can. So we're trying to reach um, state employees in every branch. We're trying within the executive branch to get diversity between small agencies and big agencies. Um, we're also looking for age and demographic diversity um, because we're trying to get our fingers out as far as we can um, to best represent um, what state employees um, are and what their needs are. Um, we are in support of this bill and um, hope you will vote in favor of it because the current restriction on uh, membership for the employee and the retiree members for the Healthcare Commission just no longer reflects the state workforce. So um, if you go back to 2000, this statute was last amended in 1992. So I could only get data on the employee composition going back to 2000, but we had 20,000 classified employees at that time, and that has dropped down to under 6,000. And there's been a corresponding shift. So in 2000, there were only 2,000 um, unclassified employees. And now we've got over 13, close to 13,000. Um, and those are executive branch. They don't include the regents, which are all unclassified now too. Um, and so restricting the employee member for the Healthcare Commission to classified service um, and the retiree member to classified service um, is really not as represent, representative of what the workforce is um, as we would like. And I would add that right now, both commissioners um, that are serving in those positions are enrolled on the health plan, um, but that requirement wasn't in statute. And we feel like they're really there to give the boots on the ground experience about what their um, health plan experiences like. And so just adding that requirement to the statute would um, be beneficial long term. So um, I finally add that the Healthcare Commission also looked at this and is unanimously in support of it. Um, and if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for your work on the bill, for working to bring it to us, and for being with us today. Committee questions? Representative Riley. <laughs> Uh, for committee, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the committee's knowledge, could you uh, briefly explain the difference between classified and unclassified for those folks that are not government employees? Sure. Um, the Classified Civil Service Act is a state law that um, I guess brought extra protections to um, some employees and had some statutory requirements for their um, hiring. I was never in classified service, so I'm probably not the best person to answer that, but unclassified is more an at-will employee, which you would be um, more familiar with. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you, Representative, and for the answer. Other questions? Seeing, do you have one, Representative Miller? I have a question for you. Are you wanting to move this bill today? Thank you. When we close the hearing, I would like to move this bill today if the committee is open to that. Thank you. Are there other questions on the uh, proponent testimony before us? And, and knowing that we do want to move the bill today, do think about your questions Mr. if Mr. you Mr. have Chair. them. Oh, thank you. Uh, Representative Berquist. Yes, and, and for the conferee, just one more clarification. And um, in your description of the change, am I making that noise? Okay. Okay. Uh, in your description, you described that it would be the non-classified 
not instead of the classified, but either classified or not classified, correct? That's correct. All We're right. Open it up so that everyone is eligible. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Further questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you again for your testimony. And um, we may, if you care to continue to listen on, we may take your bill up first so you can hear us uh, continue the debate in the committee if you wish. Um, with that, we do also have written testimony from Sarah LaFriends. And if she uh, is on and wants to uh, provide testimony or if there is anyone else wishing to appear as a proponent. Seeing none, I would uh, direct the committee's attention to that testimony that we do have. Is there anyone wishing to appear as an opponent of 2218? Anyone neutral? And anyone else at all? Hearing none, we will close the hearing. So thank you, committee. I would actually like to take action on both of the bills that we have heard as well as the bonding bill uh, yet today. So with that, I think I would ask the committee's wishes on the bill we just heard on 2218. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move the rules be suspended that House Bill 2218 be advanced for debate, possible amendment and final action. Motion Second by Mr. Representative Miller, seconded by Representative Berquist. Is that who I heard? Yes, sir. So thanks for the motion and the second. This is a procedural and non-debatable motion. All in favor, so that signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. So we are now able to consider the uh, action on 2218. Wishes of the committee representative, neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this bill, as it is brought to us today, sure, certainly shows the endeavor for transparency and to be more inclusive and to open it up to the general public or those members who maybe um, did not have that opportunity. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we pass House Bill 2218 out favorably. Motion by Representative Neighbor, seconded by Representative Bishop. Further discussion on the motion? Question, Representative Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just clarifying something here. Are legislators considered state employees? So legislators would be state employees. I'd that assume my we question. would be unclassified state employees. So I, I don't know our eligibility to serve in this capacity. So um, I don't know if our conferee is still on and has further clarification or if uh, anyone who brought the bill or the reviser would have clarification. And I don't know if that's part of your question or not. So I might look to our reviser um, as we look to uh, legislators as state employees, um, would we be qualified to participate on this board? I didn't Mr. say it Chair, right. Mr. Chair, I'm looking up that answer right now, if you can give me a moment. Thank you. We'll give the reviser a moment. Is there any, we'll return to the item. Is there any other question or discussion? None at the moment. We will await the answer. Have Director Conroy play the Jeopardy music while we wait.
Mr. Chair, um, I've looked up the definition of le legislator and uh, in a most unhelpful way, the statute defines a legislator as a member of the legislature. Um, it doesn't actually speak to whether a legislator is a state employee or not. Um, the bill itself, the statute 75-6502, does state that a state officer or employee may not be appointed as the member representative of the general public. So um, the uh, a legislator is precluded from being that person in the fifth position. But more so than anything, I think that regardless of the the individual status as a legislator um the the individual would have to be currently enrolled in the state benefits program and also be nominated or, or appointed by the governor um if you can bear with me i will do some more research overnight and get an answer definitely back to the committee but as of right now i think the statute is silent on the issue i don't have a firm answer for you representative riley and i don't know that we'll have the opportunity for that um if it so thank you other questions or discussion on the bill before us, 2218. If not, Representative Neighbor, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I close. Heard the motion by Representative Neighbor to pass 2218 favorably. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. So the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Representative Riley is recorded as no. Any others wish to have their vote recorded? Thank you, committee. Uh, the next item of business I would like us to take up is House Bill 2405, which is the bill dealing with bonding. Um, I, I will have the reviser give us a quick overview of that. Uh, I don't know that we need to go deep into the bill. We will remember that there is a technical amendment that the reviser had mentioned that we would take up uh, later. But Mr. Reviser Weiss. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, House Bill 2405. This is the uh, billion dollar uh, pension obligation bonds to uh, finance a portion of the unfunded actual liability of CAPERS. Um, the bonds would have to be issued by the approved approved by the state finance council uh, except there is a, a cap on the interest rate at 3.5 percent if it's above that then the bonds can't be issued um, the bonds would not be not debtedness or obligation of capers or and not in the uh, the state nor the power to, department administration would have the power to pledge the full faith and credit or tax and power of the state for debt service and debt service would be subject to dependent on appropriations by the legislature to pay that debt service it would be up to that it would not be on on capers to, to do that and there was the, the 2015 uh, issuance of a billion dollar bond and this is very much similar except that was capped at five percent and again this is at 3.5 percent of the interest rate so thank you committee questions for the reviser Representative Riley. Very quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what was the amount again for the cost of that bond? I, I, I remember we covered that, just was like to briefly ask that question again. Thank you, and I might ask Mr. McMurray to address that question. I'm going to answer as if uh, you hit the cap of 3.5% all-inclusive costs. The uh, annual debt service is estimated to be $54.4 million a year.
Thank you. And representative, was it the debt service or was it the cost of issuance? Issuance. A cost of issuance on a $1 billion transaction modeled based off our actual experience in 2015 is a little over $5 million. Are there any questions at this moment for the reviser in the review? If there are none, thanks for that. And that brings us forward for discussion, which is probably the best place for us to start on this particular bill. Um, Mr. McMurray, at some point I might ask if you have a summary of the Monte Carlo. Uh, it doesn't have to be right now, but looking at assumptions using the 7.5 return and the 5.2, I think, were the two that you had. I'd just be curious if you have a summary of the percent chance of outperforming the bond rate um, with, with those two Monte Carlo assumptions, if you have time. But um, I would start committee with discussion, and then we would look for uh, a motion as, as you wish to go forward. I know this is a big topic, so I don't necessarily have to start with the motion, although I'm willing. Representative Miller. Would you object to the making of a, an amendment at this point? Um, no, I would not. Uh, I would ask the reviser to forward to the committee secretary, if he hasn't done that already, what I would call the Miller Amendment. I won't tell the, tell the origin of that name. And you may explain um, in process, uh, or if you want the reviser to go over, it's at your call. I'm going to give a one or two sentence description, but then I think it would be helpful if he walked through the balloon. Uh, the balloon incorporates um, the provisions of House Bill 2289, which very briefly would mirror this bill as it relates to the borrowing aspect. Uh, it would differ from this bill in that the uh, arbitrage would be dedicated towards a 13th check for certain retirees. I'll give more detail of that in a moment. There is also some amendments uh, in the balloon that were the result of uh, Mr. Conroy's office reviewing 2289 and offering some suggestions. With that, I'd ask David to fill in the blanks, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can do that. Um, I think I believe that copy of the balloon has been uh, mailed to the members, um, but I can also walk through it real fast on the screen here. Um, on the first page, this is just kind of love that there will be now sort of two purposes for the issuance of the bonds, the, the uh, unfinal liability, and then also the, the actual liability related to the 13 check benefits that are in section two. Section two of the bill here, beginning of the, of the amendment, beginning on page three. This is all of this new language. This is taken from, as Representative Miller said, this is a kind of the baseline from 2289, um, except there is one uh, couple changes in how the uh, in how the papers board of trustees they'll actually so only certify the uh, Investment earnings on the proceeds of the bond issued pursuant to section one, and not the debt service that's that says that's outside of their purview, as it's going to be through the department of administration. And that's in C1 of, of section two here on, on the balloon. Um, and then there is also a cap in subsection D. This is different than in 2289. So subsection D would cap the retired dividend payment, that 13 check would be capped at. The, uh, the retirement's uh, monthly retirement benefits, pension only payments. Um, so even if you take the arbitrage and you run through the calculations, and you would say you give a thousand dollar benefit to all retirements, that that'd be like the per retirement amounts. If, for example, there was a retirement that has a five hundred dollar a month recurring monthly retirement benefit, that's they would get only five hundred dollars a month. They would cap at that amount. Um, and then I think everything else is, is the same from 2289. There is also a floor 
uh, on the benefit if for some reason they want to do the calculations on the on, on the arbitrage divided by the retirements. And it's going to end up with less than $25 as the benefits that we be I'm not sure what that was. I'm sorry. Um, but I think that is the, the substance of the amendment, Mr. Chairman. If that, uh, and if Representative Miller wants to add anything, also. Thank you. Anything additional, Representative Miller? Not at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions for the revisor? So I believe that this is, uh, uh, you've made a motion to amend as well. Motion to amend by Representative Miller, seconded by, by Representative Finney. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Representative Powell? Yes. In the other room. Is this germane uh, to the bill? Is this amendment germane? So, so thank you for the question. Uh, in the committee process, it, it would be allowed to offer this amendment, and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Other questions? If there is no further question on the amendment, Representative, you may close. I think that, that means this amendment is out of this world. And you did call on me to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to point out that for as long as I can recall, and I do have a shorter memory today than I once did, but Nonetheless, for some time now, state employees have been asking for and I believe are in need of a cost of living adjustment. That's what they've been asking for. I do want to clarify to the committee that the structure that's offered here is not a pure cost of living increase, which if a cost of living was given, it would be embedded in the uh, base and they would get that from then on uh, every year. This is set up in common parlance. It's referred to as a 13th check, uh, meaning they get their regular payments and then they get an additional check using the arbitrage, the profit, the difference, if you will, between bond payments, bond service, and investment income. This summer, when we once again heard from retirees during our pension interim committee that they were looking for a COLA, the response was, well, we have no revenue. So with that in mind, I started scratching my head on how we might develop a revenue source, and this is what I came up with. It's not a guarantee. Uh, it will not necessarily always be there because it's going to depend on true earnings. Uh, but at least it will provide a source of revenue for those times when we can. We can give some relief for people who are longtime retirees. The bill is structured at this point, and I'm certainly open as it works its way through the process to modification, but it would apply to all retirees who have been retired for at least 10 years and whose monthly pension is $2,000 a month or less. That would cover about 40,870 people per the numbers that I got from Mr. Conroy. And it would come at a cost of approximately, if everyone received a full check and they wouldn't necessarily get it, uh, that's what it would cap it out at is one, the equivalent of one check and no more. And if it was, fully 
funded at that rate, it would cost annually $34,600,000. Again, numbers garnered from Mr. Conroy's office. That would still leave 64,750 people who would not be getting a check. Uh, and I would like to have the bill set up so everyone got it, but I think it should be directed until we see the success of the program towards those people who need it the most. And that's what it was designed to address. Uh, I don't want to take up a lot of time. I know I already have, and I very much appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chair, that the uh, hearing on the other bill gave us an opportunity to have this idea presented on the table. I would move my amendment. I thank you again. Thank you, committee. You've heard the motion by Representative Miller to amend 2405. I am going to step to the door so I can hear both rooms on the vote in that I think it will be split and I'll try and come up with a, a, uh, a, a take from that. So hang just one moment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I sit in this room on the other days and what we've decided is just as easy to take a hand count initially because that's the only way we can see the people on the screen as well. It's just a suggestion. Hey, David, please, uh, what do you want him to do? Hey, David, please remove sharing. Um, if each person who is in their office will turn on their monitor and state their yes or no vote. Yes. Finney, yes. Representative Finney votes yes. 
Mr. Chair, did you get my yes vote, Representative Parker? Representative Parker votes yes. Do we have any others on the screen? To the committee secretary, what is our total tally? On a vote of eight, well, so actually we got to back that up. On a vote to eight to eight, it ties. The chair votes no, because I did count myself in the other room, which was wrong. So I apologize for that. Eight to eight, the chair votes no, and the motion to amend fails. So thank you, Representative. I believe we have some evidence of a fraudulent election, but nonetheless, <laughs> could I be recorded as voting aye? If, yes. Representative Miller records aye. Representative Bishop records aye. Representative Neighbor records aye. Are you recorded nay? Representative Riley records nay. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have my vote recorded as yay. Is that Representative Parker? Proctor. Representative Proctor votes aye. Would like his vote recorded. Representative Toplicker would like his vote recorded as aye. Representative Parker would like his vote recorded as aye. Representative Finney would like her vote recorded as aye. I was moving entirely too fast. Uh, I would have been slowed down on the floor uh, moving at that rate. Did our secretary have a chance to get all of those down? That would be consistent with what I saw. Would you like to read them back so that we know that you, everyone is? I might ask you to take a microphone for a moment. Representative Toplicker, Miller, Proctor, Bishop, Parker, Neighbor, and Finney all to re be recorded yes, and Representative Riley to be recorded no. Is anyone still wishing to be recorded that was not on the list? Seeing none, thank you for working through that, and thank you for a questionable process, but I hope we do agree on the final tally. So. Anyway, Representative Miller. Did I hear you right? We had a technical amendment. That is correct. I would move that amendment. Uh, Mr. Weiss, can you go through the technical amendment with us? You need a second, sir. Seconded by Representative Neighbor. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, just uh, give me one second. Okay, Mr. Chair, I, Jan, I sent this to Jan, if she could email it out to the members at, at her convenience. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's going to be just a, a sentence I forgot to add when I was putting this in from the previous $500 million and the billion-dollar bond issuance. It's um, going to be page one, line 24, right after uh, the 3.5% sentence. We insert a sentence. The bonds and interest thereon issued pursuant to this section shall be payable for monies appropriated by the state for such purpose. It's, it's really just uh, just something that got dropped on there, and I don't want it to be seen as there's you know there's some intent to not put that in there versus the others. It was really just just my error. So that, that's the technical amendment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions for the reviser? Hearing none, I think I think I accepted a second, but I don't think I ever accepted a motion. I think all we said was to distribute it. I don't know if the motion was moved, actually. So Representative Miller accepts the motion to move, and uh, we did have the motion to second. So thank you. Any discussion? 
There's no discussion. Representative Miller, you may close. I move the amendment. Heard the motion by Representative Miller to amend. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes appear to have it. And the ayes do have it. So we do have the technical amendment there. Other discussion on the bill? Everybody knows where they are. I have one possibility just to confuse the issue further because I don't think this is quite difficult enough. So something that I thought about is in, in listening to the discussion of rates, et cetera, um, the larger the issue, we can put some pressure on rate, but I wondered if we would want to step how we move into the bond. So for example, if we allowed an issue of up to a billion at three and a half percent, would we be willing to allow half a billion or 500 million up to 3.75? That is something that reflects my tolerance for risk in investing in the bond to uh, say, okay, if I can get a billion that cheaply, I'll do it. I get a little nervous myself at 4% on that, but I'm a little lower. Those caps are really important for us to consider in the committee for what our appetite for risk is if we have a desire for the strategy at all. So I do have an amendment that uh, Reviser Weiss has drawn that would provide that step to say it's a billion. If we're not under three and a half, then that's not issued, but we would allow an issue of up to 500 million for up to 3.75. And I might informally ask if there's appetite in the committee to uh, confuse it further with that, or if it's confusing enough to deal with an arbitrage bond and call it good with what's on the table. In the interim, I would ask Mr. McMurray if there's any concern with implementing a strategy that is directed as such, or if that's just as clean as uh, the, the single level bill. I don't have any reservations about that as long as it's clear and set from the beginning of the uh, onset of the transaction. Well, I, I will ask uh, the amendment is up if I if I see correctly. Um, I will move that amendment and see if anyone cares to second the motion. Representative Dodson falls on the sword. Thank you, Representative Dodson. <laughs> um, is there any further question for the reviser or discussion on the amendment with the, uh, the additional step? Hearing none, what's that? Representative Parker, thank you and please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, apologize for belaboring this a little bit. I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Um, the original bill is looking at a billion dollars. This is looking at 500,000. So is this um, only doing 500,000 uh, if the interest rate is there, or is this an additional 500,000 if the interest rate is right? So uh, the short answer would be no to both. It's actually looking at the billion up to 3.5. If it exceeds 3.5, the billion's off the table. So it's not additional, but up to 375, we would allow 500 million or half the size at an incremental rate to borrow, taking some of the risk off the table. Um, but not being certain that I want to lose the whole thing between the three and a half and 4% uh, level. So, thank you. That, that makes more sense. I appreciate it. Thank you for the question. Other questions or discussion? If there is none, if there is none, um, I will close on that motion and uh, welcome the committee's feedback on whether this is helpful or hurtful. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, aye. no. The ayes appear to have it. I might ask uh, Representative Berquist, did I miss the balance in the other room? Uh, I believe online yeah. and here. 
There was no dissenting votes. It was all aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so that uh, motion passes and that amendment is added. With that, uh, we are back on the bill. Discussion? Representative Croft, would you make a motion to pass favorably as amended? Mr. Chairman? Uh, I, I heard a name. Is it Representative mm -hmm. Howe? It is. I'm sorry. I, I had a question. Please. Uh, I know we talked about this the other day, but I can't quite remember. We talked about timing and an entry point and uh, when, uh, how much time, if this were to be enacted, would it take for um, capers to work through the, the process again? So thank you, and I might ask the director to address that, and I know that it can vary from a fairly short time to longer, and then we also would be looking at an entry point sometime in three months out to August, depending on our timing of when the bond is let. So uh, some period from now and then from then forward. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th that's correct. Once the proceeds, uh, if they come to capers, uh, they would be uh, distributed across the assets different uh, asset mix within the Capers Trust Fund. And of course, uh, half roughly are U.S. equities, about half are international equities. So those could be placed um, rather quickly. Then you get into the other ones, particularly private equity uh, and real estate would take longer for placement of that. But it would all be done under the current uh, asset, uh, or asset mix uh, of of as set out by the board. Um, so it, it would take uh, some time um, for it all to be placed, but uh, quite a bit, we'd do it just as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question. Further discussion? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move the committee pass out favorably House Bill 2405 as amended. Second. Seconded. Um, I'll take the one on, on the screen. Was that Representative Howe? Howe. So, yes, thank Mr. You. Chairman. Yep. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on the motion to pass favorably as amended? Hearing none, Representative, you may close. I close. All right. I think this one may be close again. I'm not sure. I may step to the door to take the vote and see if uh, I, I'm able to hear everybody. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And not being a tie, the chair doesn't vote this time. So I think we should have 16 votes if everyone's voting. And what is the tally? So 3 to 13, the motion passes. So Representative Riley would like to be recorded as a no. Anyone else who would like to have their vote recorded? Hearing none, thank you, committee. So, so with that, and uh, the other item that I'd like us to consider that's fresh in our minds, if we're able to, is 2399, the governor's reamortization plan. So uh, to do that, I would ask for a, a motion to consider. Representative Croft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to suspend the rules and consider House Bill 2399 for passage.
Seconded by Representative Amel Berquist. Thank you. Um, again, procedural motion. Uh, all of those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes appear to have it. Ayes do have it. Um, on the bill, Representative Croft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to allow the full chamber the opportunity to hear the governor's request, I move the committee pass House Bill 2390 out, 99 out without recommendation. Second. Motion second. By Representative Croft and seconded by, if you'd state a name. Uh, Berquist. Representative Berquist. Thank you, representatives. Discussion on the motion. There's no Mr. discussion. Chair. Oh. Mr. Chair. Yes. Representative Proctor. Representative Proctor. I, I know the hour is late, but I'd like to say something before we take this vote, if I could. Um, Please continue. Yeah. So I think uh, Governor Kelly's plan to mortgage uh, or pro the promise of capers is frankly morally wrong. You know, uh, we're putting at risk the promise we made to our public employees, and we're passing on to some future generation. Uh, some future legislature, a huge problem uh, for a small, cur cur a small temporary gain. I think this is the worst kind of short-sighted policy making that makes the people outside this building hate politicians. I really think that uh, you know the the example uh, that one of the representatives made of this being the same as mortgaging a house is fallacious. You know that if you mortgage a house and you can't make the payments. You lose the house, but you can go live in another, an apartment. There's no, there's no place that our retirees can go if we, uh, if we uh, are not able to pay on this promise that we've made to them. We're going to destroy their lives. We're going to destroy our credit rating as a state, and we're going to destroy our economy because we have to dig ourselves out of this huge hole that we're making for ourselves. And so I'm going to vote yes on this motion uh, just so that I can get this thing on the floor and get a resounding no from all of my colleagues so that we can kill this idea once and for all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Representative Croft, you may close on the motion. I close. You've heard the motion uh, by Representative Croft to pass House Bill 2399 without recommendation. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Would anyone like their vote recorded? Hearing none, is there anything further to come before the committee? Representative Miller. Uh, we should not adjourn, Mr. Chairman, until we've made an appropriate happy birthday to Representative Toplicker. I like that idea a lot. You want to you want to sing to him, or did you bring a cake? Okay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you, representatives. Happy birthday, and thanks for joining in. It, the Zoom thing has to work recorded. That's tough with timing, but I appreciate it. We are adjourned committee until the 10th of uh, March.